Let's see. That's done. That's done. That's done. That piece is good. That piece is done. That's done. That's ready. That's ready. You know what? It's time to put them all together. We'll start with the mainspring. I had to take the brace off the bottom of my engine stand anyhow to get it to fit under here. So before we get anything any heavier, we'll get this drawn up into position. Looking good there. Transmission's up next. Just trying to work those clutch disc teeth into the flywheel without hurting anything. Sixteen bell housing bolts. Later, we've got it completely bolted up to the diesel engine. Now we check out main clutch adjustment. So that's pretty close. I know they want it's about 30, 35 foot pounds snap over on that lever. We're pretty close to it right now. If it was too loose, let's see if we can get down in here. I would pull this plunger out right here and then turn the clutch spider clockwise until the peg on the end of it dropped into that next hole right there. Because we're already pretty close, that's going to actually put us too tight. I actually just tried it a minute ago. So we're just going to keep it right here for now. You can see over center mechanism working in there. We're looking at the clutch brake right down here. The collar comes up against it well, so we're going to leave it right there. As this wears in, we're probably going to have to give it that extra notch after we start running in a little bit. But for now, that's right where it needs to be. 
throw the new gasket in place. Bell housing cover goes back on. Okay, starting on the right side, gaskets in place. Final drive is next. Same deal, left side. One last look at that nice brass oil cup. Once again, this is why we had to leave these brake housings loose because you can't get this final drive bolt in down here if that was bolted in place. So that just keeps all that open on each side until the final housings are drawn all the way up. And we might as well show where the three bolts go in on the bottom down here, I think we've got enough light. So there's one long one and it goes up here. There, it starts in right there. And then two short ones. One right there. And one right there. And while we're at it, we might as well I'm at a funny angle here because I've got my working hand holding the camera. We might as well throw the plug in the bottom of the steering clutch compartment. There, we finally started it. All right, tighten all those up now. With the final drive housings bolted tight, we can finally install the brake pedal housings. These have been sitting on here for a while just waiting for those bolts back there to go in. Oh and these are uh, more bolts that I will coat with grease because they're kind of in a dirty environment and things are known to rust just a bit beneath the foot plates so I give them a little bit of help.
Next up, we'll install our cheese grater brake pedals. <laughs> they, they are really nice, hardly worn at all. So one thing that you might want to do, you'll have to position the pedal shaft in a certain spot to get the brake pedal on because there's a key on the bottom of it. You can see it fits in the, the key slot right there. You can take a socket and grab onto the Zerk fitting and actually position that shaft wherever it's handiest for install. Just a little tip. And finish up with hanging the return spring for the brake pedals. Now to adjust the brake pedal travel, it's pretty simple. Remove this little panel right here and there's the nut on the brake band. If you remember from the brake episode, I can pop a link. The bottom of that nut has like a V-shape to it. So there are two corresponding notches in that brake band loop that hold the two points of the nut. So you just run it in, you can see we're out of the groove and then there, it slipped down into it again. And just keep turning that in until you find proper travel of the brake pedal. This one's gonna need to be tightened up a little bit more. You don't really set it for good until the foot plates are on. The foot plates follow these lines right here on each side of the transmission, and there's the stop on the pedal comes up to the back side of it. So we can get it pretty close right now. If we just align this stop with that line of the transmission case, we're looking about straight onto it. So about there is going to be resting, you know, brake pedal. So we've got a little bit excess travel. The manual specifies three to four inches brake pedal travel. Personally, I like to be on the tighter end of that because I like to hit that pedal and, you know, have some feedback right away. I like it to be solid. So I'll just continue threading the adjuster nut in. Like I say, landing it. There we go in that groove. That's what keeps it centered. So we're getting pretty close right here. Once I finalize this, we'll move on to the next part. All right, down on the bottom side now, I've got the pedal travel where I want it up top. So the second part of the brake band adjustment has to do with this set screw with jam nut right there. Hopefully I'm not blocking the light too bad. So what you have to do down here now is supply the brake pedal. So I'm doing that with my other hand up top. So we've got the brake band tight around the drum right now. And we will thread this set screw in until the end of it just touches the brake band and then we back it out one and one half turns and then lock it in with the jam nuts. So brake band applied, I'll just thread this in. Okay, make sure the jam nut is not bottoming on the case. You wanna have the end of the set screw on the band itself. So there we're up against the band. Let's back it out one half, one, one and a half turns, lock it in position right there. What that does is offer support to the brake band when the pedal is released and it keeps the band from dropping down and rubbing on the top of the drum as that drum is spinning round and round in there. So just keeps it all centered and keeps it from wearing out too fast. Steering clutch levers are up now. It's all accessed in this opening right here. So we need to make that lever act more like this lever. So it's all done in conjunction between this set screw right here and that acorn nut right there. We'll start by turning this one here. This mostly sets free play of the clutch pack and the acorn nut mostly finalizes position of the steering lever. All right, I think we'll try that. We got the cotter pin slot lined up with the hole in the rod and looking at lever position, they're even. And I very much prefer the steering levers on a D2 to be canted forward just a little bit. Straight up and down is all right. 
it's a pet peeve of mine when there's so much flop that they're already angling back before you've even started pulling on them. You need to have at least three inches free play at the top. Both of these are right about on that mark. That ensures that you're not loading the linkage to the point where it's already pulling tension on the release yoke in there. So that means full clutch pack spring pressure is being applied to them. They're not trying to slip from the start. And I wish you guys could feel just how smooth and crisp the controls on this D2 are. Of course, everything's brand new. Steering clutches are brand new. Release bearings brand new. All the pivots are clean and lubricated. Even the main clutch, just crisp controls. I love it. I love it when you get a machine that's just dialed in and right like that. So we will finalize it by cinching that jam bolt, putting a cotter pin through that acorn nut just like we have here. And the controls should pretty much be done. All right, everybody, the pivot shaft is up next. The right side cap is the one that has the locating pin in it. So I just took a mallet and drove it onto the shaft. That holds itself in place. It's a lot easier aligning that before it's underneath the whole tractor. Right side track frame next. You'll notice I took the back roller off. See, it's right there. Reason for that, if we go on here straight, we're gonna have to have that roller off because the flanges aren't going to clear that sprocket. Because of the order in which I chose to do all this, this is the easiest way to do it. The other way I could do it is to leave that mainspring out. Then I could afford to kick the front of the track frame up as high as I wanted to go, get it slid on so that roller clears, and then once we're pretty much all the way on, lower the front of the track frame down, do that to the other side, but then you have to jack the front end of the machine up so far to snake that mainspring in afterward. It's just easier to pop that back roller off, take it as a straight shot. We're doing this side a little bit differently because I didn't have room to get the cherry picker put in here next to the shelves and everything. It's all right. The old floor jack will do just fine. With both track frames on the pivot shaft, the next job is to shim them for proper alignment with the drive sprocket. So the way you do that is with these bolts, heavy washers, and shims. So this washer bolts on to the end of the pivot shaft. These shims go just inside the bushing right here beneath the washer. And the washer is captured on this surface between the flange on the track frame and the underside of the cap that's held on by the four bolts. So the way you position the track frame on the pivot shaft is by varying the amount of shims that are beneath that heavy washer. And this is actually a rather critical part because you want to measure between the edge of the sprocket and each flange of the back track roller. Don't so much look at the gap between 
the shell faces, those are just unfinished areas, surfaces. What you really want to look at is roller flange to outside of sprockets. So you want to keep those perfectly in line because if the track frame is in too far or out too far, that's going to be guiding the track chain out too far or in too far on the sprocket. So you're going to be forcing the chain up hard against one set of flanges or the other all along that track frame. And you'll also be gouging, you know, the sprocket as it engages between those links. So you'll be wearing roller flanges, you'll be wearing drive sprocket, and you'll be double wearing track chain. So we need to get these shims right. And before we put a fold over lock under the bolts, we're going to just do a dry run assembly here and just double check what alignment is. Tighten everything in. I'll take the big pry bar and wedge on the inside of the track frame to make sure we're pushed tight out against that heavy washer. And then I'll just pivot the frame on the shaft a couple times to make sure that everything's nice and straight. And we measure inch and nine sixteenths to the inside of the roller flange. And we're dark in here, I know, but again, inch and nine sixteenths inside of roller flange. So we're centered up. We can put the lock under that, make it permanent. All right, this is for the full overlock fans because I always have a few that are disappointed in me, or disappointed with me, I should say. Every time I have an episode that doesn't feature fold over locks. So we are, yeah, after these, we're getting down to the end of them. I'm trying to think what else is going to have a fold over lock on this tractor that we haven't done yet. And aside from maybe a couple of them in the belt pulley attachment that I'm going to go through and put on here. I can't really think of any others after we finish with these. Left side frame now. I did actually have to add two shims on this side beneath that washer to get it all centered up. That's all right. I've got plenty of spares. So nice 90 degree bends. That's how I like to do full overlocks. And <laughs> A line I always have to shake my head at whenever I hear it. Someone says, this fold over lock's got one more fold left in it. And Squatch Rules for Life, I think we're up to number seven now. Even a brand new fold over lock only has one fold left in it. That's just... <laughs> whenever I see people refolding fold over locks, I just have to go lie down for a bit. <laughs> now all that's left is to cap those off. Remember, these are the first generation caps that don't have the grease fitting in them. The grease fitting is up here instead, so it feeds grease right between those two pivot shaft bushings. I believe the reason why they changed that rather early on and put the fitting out here in the cap is because this heavy washer, it's got two thrust faces on it, doesn't get enough grease coming through here to really adequately lubricate it long term. So we packed the inside of that cap full of grease and coated everything out here as well. Just want to help it last as long as possible. Just finishing up the cap on the right side, cinching the bolts all tight. And I think that's as far as we go today. This has been how to build a D2 in a day episode, right? Yeah, we took all those exploded diagram view parts of a D2 that were spread out across the shop floor and just turned them all into one unit. So just a couple pieces left that I was going to put on, but then I decided against it. These are the capturing bolts and sleeves that keep the mainspring caught in the spring perches on each track frame. We're gonna leave those off for now because, well, I got to thinking about it and you can see how the track frames are angling down at the front. 
they're sitting on the front roller on the floor right now. If I were to put those bolts and sleeves in, that would be actually hanging each track frame off of the mainspring. And because the mainspring is attached to the chassis and the chassis is still about halfway sitting on the casters of the engine stand, I didn't want to add that combined load to it. So we're gonna wait to put those in for when we have a jack under there and we're starting to lift the whole engine up. And yeah, the casters are the weak link. I'm not worried about the steel. The steel of that stand is gonna be just fine. So you can also see too how when I built this engine stand, I wanted to be able to put the track frames onto the chassis without interfering with the stand. So all that, you know, anchoring points and everything can just stay right under this thing. Makes it a lot more solid when you're bolting pieces on. And you could even do track chains with pads up to 12 inches wide before they get into the casters. So that's when I, when I build things, I try to think about tomorrow just as much as I'm thinking about today. So, all right. That's all we've got for now. We're gonna have to drag some more parts into the shop, start the process over again. So we're gonna start looking at throwing some track chains on it next. We got fenders, we got fuel tank pretty much done, some bracing, some supports, a lot of bolts for that stuff. Hood, track tin, foot plates, toolbox, rock guards, and probably a bunch of other stuff yet too. So still plenty left to come. Thanks again, everybody.